Man, you guys sounded good today. I'm telling you. Hey, you know what? Let's let's give let's give uh, these this praise team a round of applause, man. They are just doing awesome, aren't they? So we are finishing up our series. Who's your one? Uh, this is the last of a. It was a five part series, and today we're going to talk about it's a wonderful life. And yes, it has something to do with the movie. That's my favorite Christmas movie, but I promise I won't get too much into it and won't explain the entire movie to you and the deep thoughts behind it. But it, it is, is a powerful, powerful movie. And it's, it's powerful because it talks about a guy that, that really didn't think he made a difference in life. You know, you remember that when he was standing on the edge and, and uh, Clarence came up to him, he was at a point where he was like, you know, what, my, my life did not matter. And I don't know about you, but I, I go through periods like that where I think, you know, it's my life really matter. If it, after I'm gone, is anything that I've done really going to stand up, really going to matter much at all? One thing I do know that's going to matter is uh, I won the chili. Yeah. Just saying. See, while you all were in college prep classes... I was in home ec classes, and it finally paid off. <laughs> but it's, it's actually the first time I've ever won a chili or cook off anything. So, <laughs> oh man, we are, we are into this this series. It's been a fun series. It's about, been about the power of one, and one one person can make a difference in another person's life. And uh, I think um, my favorite theme in, mo in movies really has to be where I see myself, or at least where I want to see myself, right? Um, we, we look at, at different ones that really relate to us, and I, I, you know, my top five, four movies probably of all time, I love like The Pursuit of Happiness, right? Oh man, what a great movie to think, you know, that someone could go through so much adversity, to, that, that they were so called to do something that they, they would push through in that scene where they're in the, the subway and he's there with his son and they're trying to kick in and he's just at the lowest point in his life, but yet he's going to push through and he's going to get this thing powerful, powerful. I think uh, Dead Poet Society, man, Carpe Diem, sing, you know, saved the day, how, how he went in and he made a difference with those young men and he 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 browned it out and then my, my probably my favorite animated movie uh robots right mr bigwell see a need fill a need in that there are things that we look in those and we go man that's 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 it that's what i want to do I want to make a difference. Don't you want to make a difference with your life? Don't you, don't you want your life to mean something? And like whenever this life is over, like I want, I want to have left an impact somewhere. I want someone to say, wow. And, and you know, the truth is, and we all know this, probably years from now, three generations, <laughs> no one will know your name. Everything that you've done will be gone. It doesn't matter if, if you're whoever. I mean, we don't even talk about Steve Jobs anymore. Think about it. How quickly our memory just kind of fades on. And that, this life is so temporary. And, and that one thing, that big thing that you think you're going to accomplish, and man, people will do whatever. I'll, I'll never forget. Um, and I, I think I shared this before, but James Dobson thought that, that if he won a, a tennis tournament, that his name would go on a plaque, and they would put that into a, into a trophy shelf, and er, he would be immortalized forever. Everybody would walk by, and they'd say, yeah. James Dobson won the top tennis at this school. He said he got a call from the janitor. He said the, the trophy was in the dumpster and he saw his name on it. He said, do you, uh, do you want it? <laughs> Invested his life in something that was so temporary. In life, that's how it is. We, we invest our life in the things that have no value whatsoever. We think they do. We think that they're going to live on forever. I, I find it even hilarious that buildings that are named after people 
a few generations later, they decide to name it after someone else, and they take their plaque off, and they put another plaque on. Yeah, that didn't even work out. I remember, uh, so I was, uh, I was at Lewis and Clark Community College, and I was the, the student activities director, and we, we decided that, you know, Green Earth, we're going to save a part of, of the property that, that Godfrey owned, and that would be uh, for Habitat, for here forever. I drove down the road the other day. There's baseball and, di and softball fields, and there's <laughs> that, that very place that we saved. <laughs> it, it, well, it's a park, <laughs> so I guess it's still being used, but those trees and everything that we thought, yeah, didn't quite work out. It's amazing, isn't it? Things that we put so much into become very, very temporary. Um, the, the guy we're going to talk about today... Um, Man, I probably relate to, to Andrew, one of the disciples, probably more than anybody else in Scripture. Because Andrew is even, almost every time that he's mentioned, rarely is he ever mentioned, this is Andrew. He's only mentioned 12 times to start out with in all of Scripture. Four times he's only mentioned in the apostles. He was one of them. And then three times he's bringing someone to Jesus or at least bringing a message to Jesus and a, a couple other times. But really just passing. A Andrew's like a pass-by character. He's like a flyover state, right? Like that country song. <laughs> he's just kind of like, there's Andrew, Simon's brother. Peter's brother. Man, how many would you like to be known as <laughs> your brother's brother? <laughs> I don't know how you got along with your brothers, but that wouldn't be how I would want to be remembered. <laughs> Not as one of my brothers. <laughs> but that's what he gets every time he's mentioned. Yeah, that's Peter's brother. Andrew would never preach a great sermon. He would never be the one after Pentecost that would really... Yet, Andrew is the very first apostle. Number one. He's the first one to ever come. He was there with John... The Baptist, whenever John the Baptist says, behold, the lamb. And Andrew, and Andrew goes, whoo, <laughs> I'm going to go follow this guy. And he goes over, and the first thing he does, right, he goes and finds his brother, Peter, and brings him to Jesus and says, we have found, we have found the one. We have found the Messiah. And that's, a, that's the passage, uh, the first passage that, that I have. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of two who heard what John said and who followed Jesus. The first thing that Andrew did was to find his brother, Simon, and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Later in John 6, 8 through 11, you see Andrew again. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. In Greek, that's like sardines. But how far will that go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There's plenty of grass in that place. And by the way, that never made sense to me till I served in the Middle East. <laughs> and now I understand what it means by there's plenty of grass in that place. There is no grass anywhere. It is like desolate rocks everywhere. He said, so there's many, there's, there's a lot of grass. Have the people sit down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus took the loaves and gave thanks and distributed those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. So Andrew's only mentioned, like I said, 12 times. Four of those times he's simply mentioned to his disciples. Seven times he's mentioned as Simon's brother. Just this insignificant guy, really. But yet every time that, that Andrew is mentioned by himself, he's doing one thing. He's bringing someone to Jesus. He brought his brother to Jesus. He says, come, come with me. Come, come see what I found. Andrew was all about the one. He wasn't about the multitude. It would be Peter, his brother, who preached to the multitudes and the, the thousands would come to know Christ. Andrew was one-on-one, -on -one, making a difference, one-on-one. -on -one. And sometimes we, we, we don't see the significance of that. We see the significance of the big crowd, 
but we don't see the significance of one life. God sees the significance of one life. One life that's transformed. One life that's given over. One life that's saved for all eternity. The one thing you can take to heaven with you is the one person you share Christ with. That's it. Everything else, it's going to rust, decay, given away. Won't be here any longer. We talked about that before. You know, Shelly won't have her Lucy collection for very long. Somebody else is going to have it. <laughs> won't be able to take it up there. I don't think, you know, I can't decorate the walls like that. <laughs> we put so much emphasis on so many things, but we don't. I, I read a story, and I, I kind of want to talk about this, about the significance of one person. And uh, I'd like to share it with you. How many of you know Dwight Moody? D.L. Moody. Have you ever heard of him? The Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. Massive, yeah. Dwight Moody, evangelist of the year, went to Europe. Europe, like, had a massive revival as he was up there. A lot of people come to know Christ. Powerful man of God. How many of you know Edward Kimball? Edward Kimball was a Sunday school teacher. <laughs> That's it. Matter of fact, we don't know of anyone that Edward Kimball led to the Lord except for D.L. Moody. He walked along and uh, he felt like God was telling him this young kid, kind of a rebel, came into his class. And he really felt like God was telling him, you need to tell that kid about Jesus. It says that he was so nervous at, that whenever he was going to tell this, because he was not one that normally shared with other people, but he really felt convicted to do this, that he was so nervous he walked past the shoe store that D.L. Moody was, was working in, Dwight Moody was working in as a young kid. He had to turn around, go back to the shoe store. He was so nervous that he would embarrass the young man whenever he walked in and he found Dwight Moody was not in the shoe store. He was in the warehouse behind the shoe store. Dale, uh, he walked back and he, and he saw this young man and he began to share with him what he knew about the gospel. He says, I, I can't even really remember. If you, if you read his memoirs, he says, I can't even remember what I shared. <laughs> I just shared what I knew. And, and he accepted Christ in the warehouse of that shoe store. You may never have heard of Edward Kimball until I just told you. Most people have at least heard of Moody Bible Institute. Most people have at least heard uh, of the White Moody and a revival that took place in England where thousands come to the Lord. It all began by a Sunday school teacher, Edward Kimball, who had the courage to share with one person. I, I read about that and I... And I <laughs> I did a little study, and I'd like to, to read something with you. So Moody accepted Christ, the, and then he traveled later to England for a great awakening at the heart of a young pastor he met in England named F.B. Myers. F.B. Meyer had become one of the great expositors of the Bible and came to the U.S. and preached on college campuses and was used to convert students to Christ. One of those was Wilbur Chapman. Wilbur Chapman attended one of Moody's meetings in Chicago and became D.L. Moody's co-worker. William Chapman employed an ex-baseball player as his assistant. His name was Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday became a great evangelist and preached in Charlotte, North Carolina at a meeting organized by what is now the CNBC, but it was the Billy Sunday Layman's Evangel Evangelistic Club back then. The CBMC invited an evangelist to Charlotte. His name was Mordecai Ham. Mordecai Ham preached at a tent meeting where Billy Graham was saved. Isn't that amazing? A Sunday school teacher. Doing what God called him to do. Leading one person. Just one. That's all we know about. To the Lord. Two of the greatest, probably most famous preachers of our generation, and the generation before us, 
All because one Sunday school teacher led one person to Jesus. And God did the rest. The power of one. The power of just being obedient to what God calls you to. It, it just boggles my mind that all we have to do is just be obedient. This insignificant, or at least he thought he was, Sunday school teacher that was timid, scared to share with anybody. So nervous, he passed the place and had to go back. Finally ended up doing what God called him to do. And look at the ramifications down throughout the generations. God sees the significance in small gifts, doesn't he? He sees the significance in what we have. Not only, and he takes what we have, no matter what that is, and he uses it to bless others. That was the second thing with Andrew, right? Jesus, Jesus tells the disciples, hey, go out and see what you can find. See if you can find some food. We did that. Remember that? Remember, remember we did this, the, the what's in your basket sermon where I had you guys. I, I made you all go through your purses and we brought out food. And we found out that we could like feed, you know, half of Godfrey with what we brought to church. Um, but, but in the midst of this, he says, go out and find Find someone who's got something. You know, the people are hungry. They got to be fed. And they, and they send them out. And it wasn't that everybody, that nobody had anything. The reality was there was only one willing to give it up. He found the one child that was willing to give up what he had. He could have easily took the, the loaves and the fish and he could have brought them to Jesus and said, here you go, man, do your miracle thing. <laughs> but he didn't. He said, come with me. Let me bring you to Jesus. Let me take you to the one that can change everything. He brought him to his presence. And then God does this miraculous thing. Jesus begins to break the bread and they feed the multitude. 5,000 men. There's kids there. Evidently, the boy brought the food. <laughs> there was women there. Who knows how many? Some estimate it could have been 15,000 fed by three sardines and a few loaves of barley. Amazing. In that child's hand, he had a, a lunch. <laughs> Not a very big one. He'd probably be pretty hungry a little bit later on. But in God's hands, he fed the multitude. Not only did he feed the multitude, it said they ate till they were full. They just kept eating the food until they were completely full. Man, what you can do with what you have in your hands compared to what God can do when you give it to him. Amazing, amazing. God is, is interested in, in what we seem as insignificant gifts, little things. Yet when we give them to God, when we take the time, and probably the most precious gift that you own, in your possession is time. Time. It's valuable. To take that time to invest in another life. I'm telling you, there's no greater gift that you could do. There's no other lasting impact in this world that compare to that. To taking your time to invest in another individual. To share the gospel to another individual. He also saw the value in inconspicuous service. I had to look that up. Inconspicuous. Webster defines it as not clearly visible or attracting attention. Not clearly visible or attracting attention. <laughs> Man, Edward Kimball. <laughs> Last thing he ever wanted was attention. He was somebody that was in the background. He was somebody that didn't, didn't want to be in the spotlight. Yet God used him and his gift. It, it wasn't inconspicuous. It was major. He did what God called him to do. He walked into that storeroom. He walked into that shoe, that shoe uh, department and back into the storeroom. And he did what God was calling him to do. And because of that... 
the ramifications go on and on and on. To this day, there's a young man uh, I'll never forget. I had the privilege of leading to the Lord in the back of a UPS truck. I, I, I got a job they, uh, with UPS. I was, we were planting a church. I'm trying to get, you know, and they, they make, you know, if they hire you as a manager, they hire you in anything. They start you in the back of these, and I'm old. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm in my, I'm in my forties. Um, <laughs> But anyway, I'm, I'm picking up, I'm, I'm picking these boxes, I'm putting these up, and, and this guy's talking to me and sharing stuff, and some of the stuff he's saying is crazy, and I just stop in the middle of it, and I'm like, Joe. <laughs> and I, I begin to share with him my faith. In the back of that, that UPS truck, uh, he accepted Christ. He just got back from his uh, second tour just the other day and was telling me about how he met and the chaplain that was there and how he went to the chapel and the service and still still in the midst of it. he's married now got a got a uh, three kids it, it's 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 great to think about that there there is a middle-aged guy that i led to the lord and baptized in afghanistan the islamic republic of afghanistan uh he went through a difficult time, uh, was coming back through, needed to talk, talk with him, shared Christ. He accepted Christ. We baptized him in that country. We actually had to build a baptistry to baptize him. We baptized him. He ended up going to seminary. He's pastoring a church now. There, was, uh, <laughs> there are four children, one in Texas, one in Florida, and two that are here. All four serve the Lord. Yeah. One was singing for you. Yeah. This morning. Because somebody shared Christ with them. We brought them up in a home. And, and they accepted their faith. Not our faith. You know that's a big thing. They've got to accept this Christian walk for themselves. Not We can't do it for them. There's a man. A highly successful man, a franchisier, and if I told you the restaurant that he helped franchise, you would know it, uh, was invited to CBMC. He gave his life to the Lord. Now he uses his influence to bring businessmen to Christ. In a couple of generations, nobody's going to know my name. It just, I will be someone that was. They, they, my accomplishments, my awards, my decorations, my medals, my all this stuff that I thought would like be cool. They'll be in a, a box somewhere. Nobody will remember. Yet the ramifications of sharing Christ with Chief Potter, who is now a pastor, goes on. And he'll share Christ in his church. And, then, and people will come to know Christ in that. And who knows what will happen after that and after that and after that. That goes on. Just as John the Baptist said, I must decrease and he must increase. The only thing that matters is Jesus. And the only thing that lasts when this life is over is what we do with Jesus. <laughs> I did a little research on, on Mr. Andrew because I was, I was just curious about whatever happened to him after, after Christ died. So tradition tells us that Andrew became the first missionary to the north. He traveled up the Black Sea to a place called Kiev. Anybody ever heard of that in the Ukraine? War going on right now? All over the news, maybe? <laughs> so he traveled all the way up to Kiev. That is why St. Andrew is the patron saint of the Ukraine. Tradition states that he died in Patras, Greece, on a cross that was made in the shape of an X because he did not feel he was worthy enough to be crucified on a cross the same as Christ. They say that he was bound and not 
affixed to the cross, but they abound. It says they lasted two days. And in those two days, it says that every person who walked in front of the cross, he would share Christ with. Matter of fact, that cross, that, that X cross, is actually named Andrew's cross. It said that it took over two days for him to die. And that many come to know Christ, even during his suffering. That's a legacy. That's the power of one. So what do we do? We invite, right? Come. Come and see, right? That's what he said. Come and see. Peter, come and see this one that's been prophesied about. Come, come and see. Next, we need to invest into their life. That's a hard part because that takes time. To invest into a person's life takes time. But God calls us to do that, right? Go you therefore and make disciples, make learners, make those that are that are grasping the truths that I that you have come to know. Make disciples of all nations. And then we introduce. We introduce them to Jesus, we introduce them to others. They introduce Jesus to new people. And the cycle begins to go over and over and over and over again. In people's life, if we take an interest in them, and we invest our time in them, and we, tell, we show them that we care about them, we love them, and we're not just over there to beat them over the head with a Bible or what we believe, and we actually care about them. When you, induce, when you introduce them to the Savior, they're going to go, man, I like that. I want that guy. If he made that big of an impact on your life that you're willing to make an impact on my life, I want to be a part of this. Most people that come to know Christ later on in life do not do it uh, because they walk by and they saw a really cute sign out in front that said, you know, come to church. Or Jesus saves, you know, the big billboard, Jesus saves. Um, they didn't come to Christ because they were driving down the highway and they saw a Joy FM bumper sticker. Or, oh, that's a, not saying that's a bad thing, just drive nice if you've got it on your car. <laughs> or... <laughs> Because they had the foos, the little, the little fish on the back of their car, the little cross. You know, don't put the one where he's eating another fish. That's the wrong one. Get the one with just the fish. <laughs> Most people don't come to Christ that way. Most people come to Christ because one person decided to invest their life in someone else. And that's what God called us to do. To introduce them to the one who changed our life forever heavenly father lord we come before you and we thank you for andrew's life father god we thank you for the impact that he made lord just like uh just like george he may have thought at that time man i'm just i'm just peter's brother yet you used him to impact an entire generation and another generation and another and another. And today, 2,000 plus years later, he's still impacting us because he was willing to make the difference, willing to take the time to introduce people to you. Father God, let us have the courage to do that so that when we look back on our life, just like George looked back on his life, we can see all the lives that were impacted along the way. Father, I pray if there's one here today who does not know you as their Lord and Savior, Father, they've been doing it on their own, that today will be the day that they say, you know what? I want you to come in. I want you to take over, and I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I'm tired of trying to do this on my own. I'm giving it all to you. I'm all in. I'm 100% yours. And Lord, I pray if they pray that prayer to accept you into their life, you will transform their life. Use their life to impact another. And we just pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.
Please so stand and join us one last time and sit. No.